Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, really excited to welcome Elliot Presse Freeman today uh, to give this talk. Elliot is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at the National University of Singapore. And he's an anthropologist who researches and writes about subaltern activism, Rohingya subjectivity, and digital technologies in Myanmar. Um, he's also the co-chair of the Burma Studies Group with the Association of Asian Studies, which is uh, has just launched a really great mentorship program for applicants to higher education from Burma. So I would encourage everyone to check that out and participate. Um, so I first met Elliot uh, years ago at a very sweaty land activist meeting in Yangon, um, where he was known as the Harvard guy, even though he was currently pursuing his PhD at Yale. Um, and have been able to follow some of his work over subsequent years. So I'm excited to hear some of the work he'll be presenting today, which comes from his book, currently under review at Stanford University Press. Uh, the book deals with activism in Myanmar, with rights um, and plow protests and refusal in uh, the wake of the attempt to turn towards democracy. And um, so I'd like to, without further ado, turn it over to Elliot and Looking forward to our discussion and the talk. Thanks. Sorry, that was not a great beginning. I was muted. Um, thank you very much for, for having me. I know uh, everyone needs another Zoom talk like the proverbial hole in the head. So I do appreciate people, people coming out and listening listening to this and um, I'm excited to hear what, what you guys have to say. Thanks to Hillary and to, to Sarah for helping to organize this. It's been uh, really great working with them as well. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk today in a title, Cartoons, Curses and Coups, Interpolation from Below in a Rightsless Burma about field work that I conducted in 2014 and 15, but also stuff that's pretty relevant given, given the coup that occurred in Myanmar on the 1st of February, 2021. So I'm gonna start, start there. So this is some of the um, first shots of the, of the coup, which you may remember better by the aerobics instructor who went viral when she did a, a whole presentation without realizing that there was a coup occurring behind her. Now, the people were not impressed by this, uh, not with the aerobics instructor, she was, she was lovely, but with the military taking back power after a 10 year kind of experiment with quasi democracy. And the outpourings on the streets after a few kind of quiet days when people were still kind of uh, getting used to this new reality were boisterous and ludic and transgressive. On the upper left-hand corner, we have a elderly woman rubbing her genitals on the face of, of Men Online, the, the new dictator. Uh, but for the most part, a lot of these outpourings were from younger people. So we have a young man in a French maid costume, a woman on the right reminding the military where true power is, um, punks and um, trans and BDSM endorsers uh, were all over the place in the first couple of days. Potentially lost in this sea of, of images were elaborate occult cursing ceremonies that occurred around the country. So the first, the two on the left there occurred in Bagan, which is a very kind of a spiritual center of Myanmar Buddhism. Um, but the, these occult ceremonies nest kind of in with a certain amount of dissonance, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, with, with Buddhism. Here in the middle, a woman is dressed as um, a ghost of a ceremony. She's carrying a coffin um, predicting or demarcating the death of, of that same, same general, anticipating it. On the left, we have uh, a cursing ceremony that basically burns or, or destroys um, military figures in, in effigy. In the middle, uh, the Burmese on the top there, this is the Pitu Jainza Daipoi, which means a, a people's Jainza. This is held in Leidan in downtown Yangon. In the right, we have a uh, Nat Godol, who is about to burn a um, military figure in effigy in Pathane. So um, these cities are all over the country and they really were quite quite robust, both at the start of, of the coup, but, but also actually throughout, um, throughout the, the last couple of months. Um, some of the, of the chainsaw, these uh, is the word I'm gonna use for, or the word that is used for these cursing ceremonies, cursed um, men online's family um, to, to various um, murderous ends. And a very young astrologer called for a, a people's chainsaw 
movement um, in which everyone, not just astrologers, would be able to stand up and, and curse the, the military. Now, what's kind of interesting is that um, even at, at the start of the, of the protests when people weren't um, really getting arrested, the military actually did arrest this guy uh, for, for leading a, a people's uh, cursing ceremony against it, kind of showing that this uh, esoteric realm has a sort of potency uh, and enough so much that, you know, while everything is going on, you would be concerned about this guy um, talking about uh, um, a people's chainsaw. Uh, but not before um, there was a, an announcement that Min Online's grandson had been born without a fully working heart. This is a post on, on Facebook. Although it's very sad for this child who we don't yet know about, we have to say that Min Online has fallen under the, the people's chainsaw. So how to make sense of, of these protests? Well, some people did not care for them at all. They, uh, and th these protests being both the occult cursing ceremonies, but also some of the other things, the memes and fun stuffs as we see on the, on the right. Um, so are Jainza, these cursing ceremonies, the same as the ludic kind of um, circus cosplay? And is the ludic circus cosplay a dangerous distraction or does it have political content? So I'm gonna try to address some of those questions by contextualizing those, um, campaigns, if we could call them that, uh, in the, like, a longer uh, durée of, of protest and, in, and resistance and refusal, in other words, to that effect in, in Myanmar, asking how in a context without sort of um, a stabilizing rights framework to fall back on, how do people end up resisting? And especially given the constraints and affordances that exist under quasi-military rule. And I'll start with a short discussion of, of Jim Scott's Weapons of the Week. Then I'm going to talk about interpolation in Burmese speech culture as a vehicle for social change, and then theorize um, this as a particular kind of, uh, of interpolation called catechistic in interpolation following Judith Butler. And then I'm going to conclude by asking, um, how do we make sense or how do we come to conclusions about um, these kinds of things? Um, has there been a diffusion of the chainsaw logic? And, and if so, with what consequences? So first, how to resist uh, in a rightsless context. I want to start, of course, for those who don't know the Myanmar situation well, with a little bit of the political context. So it was commonplace to hear, excuse me, during the years of military rule, which were 1962 to 2011, question mark there being a question about whether it ever really ended, um, Burma or Myanmar was described as totalitarian. Um, now, this is understandable, um, you know, Orwell, who, who made totalitarianism, uh, well, a lot of things made it famous, but who, you know, who wrote 1984, he lived in Burma, um, it's a nice way of, of rhetorically describing a place that was pretty authoritarian, but I, I want to stress here um, that Burma was not this kind of state, uh, rather it was characterized by what we might call high despotic, but low infrastructural power. Uh, and that's a framework that the sociologist of state formation, Michael Mann, has, has come up with. More colloquially, we could say it was all thumbs to kind of put thumb in your eye, but no fingers, not that capillary form of power that we've come to know or think uh, states are defined by uh, so-called so, so modern states following uh, Foucault's idea of disciplinary society. And in a sense, this is actually not a bad idea deal for a mafia type state. You don't want to spend resources on knowing and dominating everyone, especially when everyone is not a potential threat. So you only crush what you can see and you spend your money on other things that you might like. Um, and then when someone does challenge you, you're very harsh to those who challenged your rule. So most people were able to kind of figure out what kind of situation this was, where you, how to not end up in insane prison there on the right. Um, and how to get by. So how did Burmese people respond during this long period of, um, of uh, military rule? So following uh, A.O. Hirschman, who came up with this idea that you respond to situations like this with exit, voice, or loyalty, we could say, yes, there was some of that, but there was also sort of survival and sometimes everyday forms of resistance, which following James Scott took kind of the forms of, you know, 
theft or rumors or gossip or foot dragging were the ones that he made famous studying um, Sadaka in, in an area that not so far away in rural Malaysia. And so in Burma, this often meant conducting non-political, we might gloss as civil society work. So delivering services to, to the needy, something like a free funeral society, making sure that people had uh, a dignified way of dealing with the, the dead that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. As a result, um, you had a, a pretty robust civil society, contrary to a kind of popular misconceptions, because in a totalitarianism, you're not supposed to have civil society, but you actually had one. It was just very non-politicized. That was a sort of bargain that the, uh, the civil society, such that it was, got, had to kind of do the job that the, the state um, was already, was doing, or should have been doing rather. So then the question is, how in a context kind of suffused by this sort of blunt form of, of power in which everyday forms of resistance are necessary, is it possible to bring voice, uh, to bring a sort of like non-evasive um, form of resistance uh, to bear? So I, I kind of see, or in the talk that I, I'm presenting today, I wanna argue that a lot of Burmese protest tactics are a kind of unique melding of a sort of everyday form of resistance with um, a, an explicit direct contestation of power. And that mix is obviously very interesting because they don't, those two things don't seem to go together very well. And the questions would be how to resist so vocally, militantly, without rights to fall back on. How to take things that are effectively similar to avoidance resistance and make them work in, in the open. Okay, so these are the activists I spent um, a couple years with and, and I'm in, in touch with a lot um, in the aftermath of the, of the coup. And these are the kind of people who on one hand, one hand have this very um, kind of robust resistance oriented direct contestation of sovereign power uh, aspect to what they're doing. So they're willing to protest, to be arrested, to be beaten, to go to prison. Um, you know, they'll tear off their shirt and scream, shoot me now, I'm not afraid to die. They'll tell people, you know, I've been in, incarcerated for longer than you've been alive. There's nothing you can do to me that hasn't already been done those kinds of things. But they also bargain, cajole, tease, beg, plead. And what's more, they, they interpolate. They, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute, or they, at least they, they try to. Um, and I conducted participant observation with these guys in the book that Hillary was kind enough to mention, uh, focuses on, on them and then what has been happening in, in the coup. Okay, so what do I mean by interpolation? Um, so, Interpolation, whoops, was made famous by this guy, Althusser. Tricky word, often misspelled with an O, which is to insert something in, but interpolation is, is quite different. Made famous by his famous example, sorry, made famous by his famous example of the policeman beckoning uh, someone on the street. And the policeman yells, hey you, and the person turns around. And in that moment, um, the person becomes subjectivized by that power. And, and there's something interesting linguistically going on here too. There you have a second person uh, pronominal, pronominal address. It's pretty vague in English. Like you, who is that person? Is it, is it a singular? Is it a plural? So there's this interesting element of choice when you think that you um, are the you that is meant by, by the policeman. So this, according to Althusser, is how we become subjects, both as the agent doing the action and, but also as the entity subjected to power, so subject in kind of that, that cool, that double sense. Um, to give a short kind of like personal example of, um, of interpolation, I am living in Singapore most of the time and I imagine my little acts of everyday resistance to tie in with another theme of the talk is you know, jaywalking because I'm not gonna be told what to do. Um, and one time about six months ago, I was crossing the street and I heard someone go, hey you, and in that moment, I turned and the anxiety that I felt and the fear of getting in trouble showed that I had been interpolated as, as a subject who was actually you know, beholden to the law as much as I wanted to think otherwise. It turned out the person who was yelling, hey, you was just a person on a bicycle who wanted me to get out of the way because people drive, ride their bikes on, on the sidewalk. Anyway, that's a sort of moment of the hey, you actually happening in, in, in real life. But um, if, interpolative performatives merely flowed from systems of preordained authority, so people like the policeman, then we would be incapable of accounting for two empirical realities. This is what 
Judith Butler in, uh, in what I think is a really wonderful book, uh, Excitable Speech points out. She says, how to make sense of the fact that those people in positions of pre-ratified authority, the policemen, for instance, they make demands that actually sometimes fail. Sometimes people don't listen to the dictator anymore. They, they walk away. And the kind of inverse of this or converse is how claims made by those who are previously excluded from positions of authority sometimes succeed. Uh, how, and basically, without considering those two key phenomena, endogenously generated social change. So change that comes from within, not you know, you know, someone, the cavalry coming from the international community, for instance, would be really difficult to account for. And what Butler's uh, framework does, I think, by introducing this idea of catechesis, is it provides a model or a potential uh, room for maneuver that um, someone like Bourdieu, who she's critiquing, uh, doesn't. So what does Butler say? Okay, so how does catechistic interpolation work. So she identifies what, what catechesis means is a phenomenon of mishearing, which she means like literally, but also sort of like conceptually or figured, figuratively ends up producing a sort of dissonance in which a new truth is created. So in the example of the hey you, um, there, she writes, there's the turning around to the yell is a strange sort of middle ground, which is determined both by the law and by the addressee, right? So it's not just the policeman who gets to decide on the ultimate meaning here. And this uh, is following the semiotic approach that I'm, I'm taking uh, is important because there's a, you know, uh, an interaction between these two terms and the meaning of something provisional or ultimate or otherwise is not just uh, usually determined by one aspect. It takes two to tango kind of idea. So she says, by neither unilaterally or exhaustively. So the upshot here is whereas Althusser seems to have a pretty static conception of the subject, Butler's version makes it dynamic, mutable, able to even resist, which is useful, useful for social movement practice. And I'm gonna show how um, in these cursing rituals. But before slash as a way of getting into how interpolation works in Burma, I wanna introduce political cartoons or just cartoons in general, which are a particularly dominant and potent text genre in, in Burma. So they constitute within them multiple sub genres. And what I mean by this is that typically cartoons in um, an American newspaper, for instance, tend to be straightforward satire. But in Burma, you'll get uh, dramatic representation bordering on the maudlin here. This is a, uh, with a sort of damsel in distress motif in which these characters are complaining about the, the floods that hit Burma in 2014 and 15. There's things that are kind of like straight news. There's more, there's kind of like an editorial style of a picture is worth a thousand words in which they're really just condemning something. There's no, uh, sometimes there's no even actual play aspect to it. Um, Cartoons are so important that there are numerous festivals around the country that bring hundreds of participants, sometimes thousands. I encounter cartoons blown up to, you know, four foot by six foot as a way of kind of iconically representing uh, things that are, are difficult to put into words. Um, and cartoonists are famous and politically active. So Maman Fountain, uh, the gentleman on the right there is talking to politician activist Coco G. And uh, so like they're household names in, the, in a way that I don't think they are in many other contexts. Now, within, uh, because cartoons are so important, they become a space in which a lot of the uh, anxieties and issues that are important to Myanmar people are, are framed and in, intervened in and critiqued. And then language itself becomes an object of, of reflection often enough, which will, which will come, come up later. So, um, here we have a figure who looks like Dosu uh, playing on a proverb, which is everyone is in agreement that eat is jue. So the orthographic tokens here, one is eat and the other one is jue. So they don't sound anything alike and they mean very different things. Jue means buffalo. Um, they look kind of similar. And so the idea here is that democracy provides a framework in which dark-skinned outsiders, you know, the Muslims that many um, right-wing Myanmar people dislike, are able to change the very meaning of language itself. And so this is a very right-wing right -wing cartoon. Here we have another one where um, the military, now that they get to lead a peace process, are saying things that they don't at all endorse. And the people on the right say, oh, now they've got the words. Um, and here we have uh, an editor correcting his uh, keyboardist who um, says, pay attention to your typing. It, the word isn't various enemies, it's Yangon. It's not bad domination of law, it is rule of law. 
It's not holder, holding a dagger over people, Chrissy, it's democracy. These sound a lot better in, in Burmese. Um, the kind of the point being is that the malapropism tells a sort of obscene truth here. And the quick point here is that cartoons are this really interesting perverse space, perhaps equivalent to the stand-up stage in the USA before all of our comedi comedians became reactionary snowflakes, am I right? Um, in which anxieties about truth itself, language and, and its meanings are expressed and, and addressed. Okay, so it's not surprising that cartoons come to stage and represent some of what I'll, I'll describe as really important political dynamics. One of the really cool and very common sub sub subgenres uh, of cartoon or political cartoon in, in Myanmar are ones that I'm going to call the you know the cartoon of of catechistic uh, interpolation. And this is in which the elite has gone down to the grassroots and he hears something which is not meant for him and actually isn't really addressed to him, but because uh, he recognizes himself in it, he goes, right? He has that moment of being shocked into, uh, it interrupts his flow to where he was going to perhaps who he was being and it resubjectivizes him a little bit because it wasn't really meant for him. Um, and then, you know, he has this lackey here on the right who, you know, who says, don't worry, it's not actually about you. Uh, they're just talking about, you know, themselves and, and you know, what, what areas they're trying to get. It's not you they're talking about who's doing the stealing. There's tons of these cartoons. You have um, a, a musician who's, you know, singing to his sweetheart um, and um, the lyrics are interpreted by the elite with this gombaun uh, headpiece is being directed at him. Um, one here, same, same issue over here with the guy on the right, um, and then more, more tokens of this, of this common, common type. Um, now, as you might guess, there are um, resonances with, uh, in Burmese history or genealogies, you might say, of this form of address, um, and kind of like a classic way of how to speak to those in power. So Michael Ong Twin, who recently passed away, um, he, in one of his many articles, he wrote about this thing called sound pyo, which is sort of um, an indirect speech, right? Kind of like innuendo or, or uh, we might say like indexical speech where you're pointing in one direction that, that it seems different than what the words themselves actually mean. <clears throat> so to quote him, he says, advice given by ministers to kings in the past was often meant for contemporaries of the author. This was a method for criticism without fear of punishment. In present day spoken usage, this particular approach is called sound biot, a sarcastic innuendo referring to disguised criticism or public slander, which though directed at, say, a child, is in reality meant for a nearby person who can hear one's statement and for whom the criticism is in fact meant. So basically, the um, old style version of like subtweeting someone. <laughs> it avoids direct and in Burmese society demeaning confrontation. And if we all recall our Michael Silverstein's famous, well, at least to some particularly nerdy uh, of us, um, this model is a form of what Silverstein called residual semanticity, which what he meant was, all I said was, so you can flee to the, to the denotational meaning of words and pretend, like, reject the idea that you, know, you meant this for, for the elite. And, and to be fair, in the, um, in, in the cartoons, um, you know, it doesn't seem like the characters do mean it for the elite, but we as the cartoon readers do. And that's why it's so deeply political. So the cartoonists try to present these characters as sort of like, you know, representatives, indexical icons of social types. And the cartoons attempt to sort of compel a secondary interpret interpolation on the part of reading publics. So I'm reading this thing. Do I identify with the elite who's getting beckoned uh, and come to my, see myself as others do? Oh shoot, that's how I'm seen. Or with the person interpolating him and hence see how my fellows see the elite. And so here we see a sort of join attention around these particular political issues. This, I know that you know, that we all know aspect that kind of like coheres uh, social focus on um, key issues. Okay. so. If that sort of catechistic interpolation in cartoons, uh, let's move then to um, how it plays out in, um, in actual cursing. So a sort of bridge cartoon is, uh, <laughs> is this one here where the woman uh, goes to the, the land records office or the all-in-one office here and says, if officials who do not take bribes in these offices uh, exist, I want to pay respect to them. And there's a man who's sweating as a, as a result of this. Um, now, is she 
so benighted and backwards as to think that one must pray for services? Is that the joke? Um, there's no diegetic clues. Like she's not winking at us. We don't really know. Um, but everyone I've ever read this cartoon with see the woman as strategically switching into a religious register of speech in order to comment on supposedly secular man, um, matters. And, but why, why does she bother to do that? Why does the official hiding behind the wall start sweating? And this is where we can take the sort of uh, esoteric realm, realm seriously, even when it, it's used strategically by, by political actors. Okay, so this guy, the reason why he's sweating is sort of like a, a preview of what's to come in the next couple of minutes. He must decide whether the message is for him or not and what kind of consequences, perhaps real esoteric ones that deal with the, his afterlife or, or, or such, attend not taking up that call. Okay, so now we're gonna finally, after all of that uh, <laughs> initial um, digression, go into actual cursing rituals. And I'm going to argue that they are a form, even though they seem quite direct, they are a form of catechistic interpolation. They rely on a form of mishearing uh, or, or, or reorienting the object of the curse to see themselves as, um, as cursable, basically. Okay, so what is what do, what do these cursing uh, ceremonies and, and attacks are, look like? So here's one that was set up um, in downtown Yangon as part of a occupation of um, Mahabandula Park there uh, by a group called Michanggan who were trying to get their land back and they had lived there for almost a year, which is was pretty crazy that this happened in one of those sort of canary in a coal mine moments where they got away with it pretty much and early on in the transition and people were starting to think that this could be a real thing. Um, I spent a lot of time with, with these guys and, and mostly women actually. And uh, I asked them where, um, you know, what sort of esoteric uh, lineages they were drawing on in the image of the, of the ogre there on the, on the right and the left. And they said, oh no, that's just the scariest ogre we could find on the internet. <laughs> we printed it out, uh, sort of showing the way that they were playing fast and loose sometimes with, with these, uh, these registers. So the curse there on the left, which is in the long block quote, says the officials who have abused the law, made these aforementioned big people and their following generations meet with violent deaths and with various tragedies and may they live on Michangan land as spirit ogres through their successive lives and may their blood boil to their death in the past, in the future and in the present on this land. May they live as ghosts and spirit ogres for 505 worlds without being liberated until the end of the earth. May they be led by the earth ogre to violent deaths, may it be so. Um, in another one of these cursing ceremonies that took place in Lepidown, one of the key um, uh, spaces of, of anti land grab activism. We have characters who are actually dressing up as, as uh, the spirit ogres themselves or the ancestors of the land who are gonna be raised through um, essentially a, a seance of sorts to come judge who, who the rightful owners are. And I left the, um, the original sources in here to show that these, to show the sort of like indices of circulation, that these were pictures that were being picked up and actually circulating in a book called the Lepidown um, Myogun, Myojun over there, which means the, the uh, chronicle. So like in real time, journalists were writing books about what was happening and focusing on these, these chains up. Um, at that same place, one of the cursings uh, re read, the cursing attack has been done. May those people who gave permission for the murder, the land grab, the Lepidon Copper Project be known. Today is a chains off in the masses. May those Copper Project murderers and land stealers go to hell. So that's pretty, pretty direct stuff, but we can also note the sort of like leavening bodily hexis. So the way the body and the words interact to create not so, um, in, in a way like a, a, a sort of leavening effect. So it's not so much a direct confrontation, but they're sitting there placidly, uh, their bodily comportment being one of those who's directed towards another um, sort of um, cosmological system of authority rather than the one that they're directing this to, which are the, you know, the people who gave permission for, for the murder. So I was really interested in these things and I wanted to, um, to study them. At, and I was already going around with these with the activists who were going to visit Lepidon. And so when I got there, I asked the, one of the main activists um, who I'm gonna call So Ong, like what were the roots of these village-based esoteric knowledge? Where did it come from? I wanna, and I had to admit this is a little bit um, 
uh, maybe exoticist of me trying to, you know, but, you know, admittedly, I was just trying to find out where I was from. And at this point, Song smiled and he looked around at everyone and all the, all the other Yebo smiled too. And I, re- wait, what's so funny, realized that, that I had obviously made a huge stupid mistake. And he, uh, So Ong said, well, look, this didn't come from the village. This actually came from, from me. I grew up in Yangon. I was uh, doing um, volunteering for the Free Funeral Society as a way to learn how to be an activist. And we handled all of the bodies. And so I made up these, these chainsaws. So it was a kind of a funny inversion, but also shows the importance of this sort of indirect focus on uh, indirect political focus that was um, that had been um, led uh, at an earlier time when people couldn't go to the streets. So um, in terms of those esoteric rights, Koto, his colleague said, there are many things that must be done according to tradition. You have to create a shed so that everyone knows there is a death and you have to burn the slips of paper and make an invitation letter for the funeral. On the third day, hire a car and take the body to get burned, et cetera, et cetera. There are so many things you have to do. And because they had this esoteric knowledge that no one else had, they actually had something that was pretty valuable and the villagers were interested in their knowledge. Okay, so how do these curses then work? Um, Godal, who just who is one of my main interlocutors who just described that, said they're useful for two reasons. One is to unite the villagers and, and unite one another. The other is to threaten the cronies who took the land. So accidents that had ceased to be random and are seen as motivated by, by deeper causes. And while the esoteric power can be counteracted through other esoteric power recruited by the objects of the curse, so the generals can get their own um, soothsayers to, to pr- provide uh, you know, apotropaic magic to protect them, there's always a reason that such counters will, will fail. But there's a third reason, the sort of social shame uh, that comes with this. And this is where I want to f- return to the interpolation point. So as Koto put it, put it, sorry, the cronies also feel shame about it. They're really angry about it. We heard the news about it through our men and sometimes through authorities and SB, which is the special branch military police. For example, when SB told us about the crony, they said the boss is really unhappy about the chainsaw. He is just a kind man. The farmers misunderstand him and should not do like that. Um, so central to these things and, and is that I, ability to get the object of it to come to identify with it as, uh, as being sort of subjected to social uh, shame. So rather than dismissing the curse as a desperate tactic, as not having any bearing on his life, he not only feels assaulted by the curse, but effectively appeals to the villagers to call it off. So here's that moment of catechistic interpolation. The crony hears the curse is directed at him as taking hold on him. He is kind of subjected to by and, and, and through it. Um, here's a lit, way after most of the protests had, had come off the streets as the, after the military cracked down in the aftermath of, of the coup. I'm, I'm jumping, you know, seven years later here on June 17th. We had a commentator put it about a monk funeral that was turned into an anti coup chainsaw type way. He says, if men online comes to feel ashamed, he will come to die 10 times. So it's the, the efficacy of the ritual is not saying the magic words, uh, is not having the, the, the most potent, powerful you know, monk. It is getting the uh, object of your curse to believe it. And then there will be real consequences, you know, come to die 10 times. Now that could be um, metaphorical, but it also could be, could be real. Oh yeah, that's where, he, that's where they say that. Okay, so there's another way that, um, that the curse interpolates is that it kind of induces self-interpolation through the, the sort of semantic structure of the curse itself. Um, so the language of the chainsaw uses a sort of public broadcast model um, of speech outlining certain roles being performed, welcoming people who fit those definitions to identify themselves as the cursed. So take, if we look at some of the actual wording here, may those people who gave permission for the murder, go to hell. The ones who did the murder, the officials who have abused the law. May the government police soldiers who gave suffering to the students and people. Same with her, you know, may I give respects to anyone who actually fulfills these criteria. So you have a situation here where um, the people are welcome to come see themselves uh, as uh, these social types. And depending on how they they evaluate the situation, they come to see themselves as as being the object of, of the curse. (laughs) 
Okay. Um, then there's a sort of interesting aspect here in which, um, uh, and I'm not sure if this deserves its own section, but there's an interesting phenomenon in which there's like a development of a, a beliefs without believers um, here. And what I mean by that is that you have these highly photogenic rituals and their strategic stagings and circulations kind of creates publics who overhear it. And the performance works to the extent that it calls the addressee to consider this alternative field of power and consequence, but also to consider others considering it. Um, and so what I mean by that is that protesters may not believe in this form of power, but they may suspect that the objects of it, the generals do believe. The generals themselves may or, or may not believe and may even suspect the protesters do not believe, but may be concerned that some overhearers who we might call broader publics do believe and or may be concerned that these publics are stunned at the audacity of protesters publicly shame the generals that way. Finally, broader publics may also not believe, but may believe that the generals believe. Something they may believe is revealed when generals take actions against protesters. Look, they must believe in what in this stuff because that's why they're bothering to throw the, the, Pitu, the people's chainsaw guy in prison uh, after the co first couple of days of the, of the anti-coup uprising. And yet generals may only take these actions because they believe that broader publics believe in the power of chainsaw. So Zizek had, um, gentleman there on the right, has this idea of beliefs without believers. And at first glance, it seems to kind of fulfill his definition, um, but that may overstate the binary between belief and, and non-belief. What seems at play in Jainza, which is similar to observations made by others of ontologies that decenter or de-emphasize belief and instead foreground material practices. So people like Rodney Needham and Malcolm Ruel, um, is not only that potent cultural scripts mobilize people with different levels of belief, but that their potency enrolls people into actions difficult to differentiate with the actions of believers, which has a secondary effect on interpreters who find themselves pulled into more active participation as well. Um, a better way of putting that might be to, to quote um, a response during the anti-coup Jane Zod described above, um, in which the person said, I don't believe at all in any of this cursing yada yada stuff relating to past lives, but if it will hurt the dictators, I will follow it believingly. And regardless of whether the po po poster tactically acts as if he believes or commits to the belief because it will hurt the dictators, such engagement may produce similar effects. Going back to that point about joint attention in which everybody can, tends to focus on this particular stuff. Finally, um, how the curse interpolates number four, sort of refusal or reanimation of, of sovereign domination. So Zizek uses Santa as his example of beliefs without believers. It's a, an intentionally frivolous example, but the chainsaw is not. It invokes an alternative dimension of authority and morality that is somewhat impervious to secular realm domination. You can seize the state, you can do whatever you want to our bodies, but you can never eliminate the curse. The karmic consequences, the cosmological consequences are something that you can't evade. And you may, it, you know, the signs of, of your demise might not be co come to you tomorrow or the next day, but they are potentially coming. Um, and that focuses everyone on, on this. Um, so, Jane's app can be used according to Godot when you feel that you are being oppressed and when there is no justice for you. So a sort of ultimate weapon of the weak tactic. Um, and its efficacy depends on compelling the addressee to interpolate himself into a new understanding of the situation um, and of himself, usually a him in, in this case. Um, although there are some pretty villainous uh, female characters in, in, tied up in the Myanmar's military. <clears throat> But it's also a weapon of the strong because it operates without the sanction of those in positions of power. It refuses that entire paradigm. Um, it's kind of both. It's, it's uh, basically conjures sovereign power to refuse that very paradigm of sovereign power itself. It says this other uh, you know, cosmological plane is, is more important. Okay, but our curse is the same as cartoons. And what I mean by that is that in distinction with the cartoons, which craft a sort of fantasy space in which elites overhear the, the downtrodden, I mean, the, basically the cartoonist is in control of the scene and they get to present the elite as actually being shamed in being interpolated into, uh, into shame and, and to see themselves differently. Now, um, that's very different than what happens with actual uh, political practices. Um, they have to occupy real public areas, carve out real spaces of encounter um, in which elites, overhearers, and movement members are all compelled to respond. But 
The risk, of course, is that they might not. And so a semiotic approach, which I've gestured towards a couple of times during this talk, talk the sort of study of sign, press, sign processes sorry, that stress that meaning is co-produced, means that something like a chenza takes on its meaning given the broader publics who are overhearing. Is this a bunch of silliness that I can ignore or is everyone else taking it seriously? Is a conversation we might imagine um, the object of a chainsaw uh, to have with himself? Is this an, just an ogre or is this about who I am? Um, so how the crony responds is influenced by the, I know that you know that we all know joint attention aspect around the chainsaw event. So this is full of promise because you know conditions can be changed but also of, of peril. And I, I'm sometimes afraid that in our hopes that domination will be defeated at least someday that we often ignore the failure that often comes even with these really courageous movements. So in conclusion, what conclusions can be drawn? Because did the curses ultimately matter? The ones I was studying 2014 and 2015, can we say that the land grab activists actually won? Um, this is a hard question. When we are assessing the efficacy of a protest, what are the criteria of, of success? Did they have to win and by what measure? Was it enough that Lepidon folks refused dispossession for eight years? And if they lost, which by many measures they did, um, why? So was it because the crony did not care, could not feel ashamed in front of people so far beneath him? Because interpolation is a fairly desperate tactic and it's just one way that a crony or a general or whatever is interpolated. In other words, the crony or or general, the object of the curse, may fear cosmological consequences, but he's also interpolated by other domains, those of his elite pals who valorize his increased um, material wealth, such as in the gems that many of these generals have. Okay, and returning to the mediating figure of the cartoons, this intermediary, intermediary can either act as the audience of the interpolation, sharpening its effects by saying, oh shoot, you, you did just kind of get called out there, or he can act as the one who sort of denudes it of its assault, reassuring the elite that all is well, it wasn't meant for you. Um, one interpretation is that during the transition period of 2011 to the coup, the NLD kind of played that role. Now the NLD is the main opposition party, the, actually the can't even call them opposition for those five years when they were in power. And then they won the election in 2020. Now, earlier during the long, like between 1988 and 2011, when they existed, but were in various forms of exile, they could pose themselves as the audience witnessing the abuses of the military state. When they finally became that state and its elite, elites forged uneasy um, political and class sort of bargains with members of the military, the NLD kind of siphoned off the effect affect in the assault. Like, and this was borne out by my activists, friends and colleagues who felt like they had a hard time operating in, in, for, the, for the people during those years when the NLD was in power, even when they felt the NLD was betraying the people. Because it just, it was easy to go against the military uh, icon of all that was bad, but the NLD was a little bit more complex. Okay, so obviously I'm wrapping up. Obviously that didn't last, right? So the military and the NLD's elite consolidation didn't um, obviously play out that way after the coup in February. So how to make sense of, of what's going on? So the earlier chains that I presented here in the talk and the protests between February and particularly May uh, 2021, they partook simultaneously in the serious and, and the playful. Both are reliant on calling publics to hear their messages, both relying on appealing to those in power, even as they also refuse the symbolic terms and terrain on which those in power operate. The gentleman on the right there refuses the sort of um, sovereign contestation that comes with protesting in a, in a dignified way. He says, I'm gonna protest the way I want to. And the, the chains up, um, they appeal to a cosmological plan that rejects sovereign power as well. But um, I think, it, it would be premature to say that wraps things up in a tidy package, isn't this great? Um, it, you know, Myanmar is at a really tragic moment when, uh, and I don't, I can't really overstate this enough, is, you know, that there has been this brutal coup. And while people are understandably, um, in a way, kind of excited about the potential to get a real revolution, they also acknowledge that that's going to be really difficult to achieve. So how then to make sense of activist work in, in Burma? So 
because it's impossible to know how things will end, any of their actions. And given that every iterative stage apparent victories might end up suddenly sundered, it becomes apparent that rather than focusing on whether victories are achieved, we should look at the actions and the activist lives that enable them as these sort of potent constellations that explode with potential future trajectories. An active this does not like following someone like, you know, a speech theorist like Austin and the performative where saying makes it so, right? The action does not immediately enact a new and inevitable future. Instead, her, the activist body and words initiate a potential trajectory, one that haunts the existing one and which threatens to return as a sort of revenant later. And that's why we have that ghost there in, in the middle who's kind of haunting the, the current um, reality that the generals are trying to institute. And this is both hopeful while acknowledging the grimness of the situation. So activists are hence sort of guides to alternative futures, uh, laying down different pathways that people could potentially take. The actions that the activists I work with in 2014 and 2015 were not always successful, but were able to seed the ground of a repertoire of contention that allowed these anti-coup um, protests to sprout up without any central organization, playing on the ludic and transgressive tropes, pulling from the same symbolic cultural material. Now, this does not guarantee the revolution will be achieved. Of course, there is undoubtedly neither a right to victory nor to escaping death, but activists insist that such a trajectory exists that gets everyone to victory. And if everyone has the courage to go together, it can be achieved. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Thanks so much, Elliot. Um, that was great, jam-packed talk. Um, so I wanna invite uh, folks to go ahead and put some questions in the chat. I see we have one coming in already and I'll give folks a few more moments to formulate questions based on that very rich talk. Um, but maybe I'll get us started with one of my own, uh, which is, I think to put it simply, does it matter that the cartoons are funny? <laughs> Um, so this is a really great semiotic interpretation. And as you know, that's not my field, that's, that's your specialty. But it was just striking me that one way in which both cartoons and ritual, in this case, cursing rituals are the same is that they're embodied actions that produce a sort of bodily response, which is something that you get to in the conclusion to the talk. And, and it's in that sort of affective response or embodied participation that there's this collectivity that's, that's reproduced that um, perhaps allows people to endure even under very, very difficult circumstances. So yeah, I was just curious how you think about um, the humor element in this work or the, the emotional element in these types of rituals and, um, and media uh, objects. Yeah, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful question. I, I, in kind of like, I hesitate to say in future work because it sounds so pretentious. Um, when I have a chance to think about that stuff more. I mean, I do have stuff in the book about like the role of humor as a sort of kind of ambiguous tool in the sense that it both can, um, you, know, the, you know, the worst thing that a dictator wants is to be laughed at, right? But at the same time, it can also sometimes siphon off uh, affect when, when things get reduced to sort of like just a joke. And um, I think sometimes humor um, becomes this sort of, uh, that same perverse space where, where things get worked out that wouldn't be able to be addressed um, otherwise, the sort of uh, idea that we let stand-up comedians say offensive stuff um, because of their chance of stumbling upon something that's really true. Um, and they are now complaining about free speech, not realizing that, uh, that uh, whatever. I, I don't know why I'm so upset about that. It's, that's neither here nor there. Um, but I, I, I would say that the to kind of stumble by uh, addressing your, stumble into addressing your, your question that um, the, the role of, of humor is something that is infused into um, all of the uh, activist actions, um, not, maybe not all, but in, in most of them. And I think it becomes a, a way of um, playing on this dialectic between direct confrontation and then sort of refusal of the very terms of that confrontation. And this is one of the themes of, of the book, which I didn't have a chance to get into during the, the talk, but um, recent theorists of, of refusal have insisted that it's a sort of demand to have one's sovereignty recognized. And I tend to not see 
refusal that way because um, uh, sovereignty itself is a sort of weird uh, uh, fantasy in, in some senses, but it also is not a position that most uh, people who are, are fighting against a regime like this can enact. And so they, the sort of move against sovereign power is a, is a turning away to get enough strategic space to be able to maneuver. Otherwise you're going into to certain death. And so, okay, what am I talking about and how this relates to humor? Well, humor becomes a, a way of, of doing that same kind of deflection rather than taking on directly the sort of consequences of their situation. Humor becomes a way of, of like refusing the sort of full um, uh, emotional and affective heft mm -hmm. of something that's bearing, bearing down on you. But it, it's not the same sort of Bartleby the Scrivener refusal where you just end up becoming so withdrawn that you aren't still able to trouble the, the, the sovereign, right? So humor becomes a, a tactic that, can, that then can be redeployed as a, as a weapon. Sorry, I'm rambling a little bit here. No, um, that's useful. I think I'm um, just thinking about the, also the sort of collective resource of humor, right? The ways in which I'm sure the activists you were hanging out with spend late nights drinking beers and shooting the shit together. And that becomes something that, you know, while it prevents sleeping, actually um, fuels the ongoing efforts um, of their very exhausting work as activists. So yeah, that's just another element that came to mind in your talk. Um, and I'm also reminded a bit, or was at the beginning of the talk of um, recent event here at the center with uh, Tamara Lose and um, a Thai activist uh, using a lot of those sort of similar transgressive images from the Thai democracy movement from queer and feminist activists and saying that, you know, the radical nature of this protest really, um, it, it's a more sort of radical form of democratic protest than what we've, what we've seen in the past. So just, just thinking across borders with the ways in which this is also resonant beyond Myanmar in the region. Um, so that, I have another, that actually, yeah. That <laughs> relates to Eric's question because he was actually yeah. asking explicitly about, um, about stuff in Thailand and, and the sort of comparative lens, the, the sort of Final question there is how important is the particular configuration of state, civil society, media, and subalterns in understanding the meaning and significance of political curses in in the public in the public sphere? Um, it's a good question, especially. I mean, I don't know the Thailand situation as well, so I can't speak to the to the way curses operate in that particular um, context. But I would say that. Um, Myanmar folks have learned to not trust much of what comes from from the media and and so that whether it's from the military during the long years of military rule or um, <clears throat> the international media which they didn't trust because it told them things they didn't want to believe about the Rohingya genocide um, and and now of course there's some there's some weird cognitive dissonance when people are are now uh, saying, well, the New York Times says that the military is, has committed a, a coup. And you're like, but that's the same New York Times you said was you know, full of fake news during the, the, the genocide. But what I do think is, happens in, in that context is that there are these sort of micro publics that emerge in which um, sort of effective truth um, is constructed by smaller groups of, of people and not reliant upon uh, a mass media. And so as a result, there is a lot of space for um, political meanings of things to be generated um, by smaller groups uh, of people. Now, what kind of con what consequences that have for something like um, uh, a chainsaw, it, <clears throat> that, um, and like, and then how, what would be the comparative um, difference with with something that goes on in in Thailand? Um, I haven't really thought about about that. I, what I would say is that it makes it really difficult as a social scientist to adduce sort of uh, connections and genealogies in which you can say, look, the you know, Jainza existed as a as a national as a national discourse. It, instead, it kind of virally spread from one place to another, where it started in Lepidon and then it popped up in um, uh, uh, Michangan, the one in in, um, in Yangon. And then uh, I would see one happen in in Shan State, and I would ask, 
ask uh, you know my colleagues like was this you guys did you do you do this and they're like no they must have read about it you know <laughs> online or something like that um yeah eric's question also gets me thinking about sort of non buddhist communities within myanmar and where the points of connection would be so i think of I, I know this is maybe a, a follow-on question from Eric's before we turn to Kurt's question, but um, yeah, is there a participation by the non-Buddhist community in occult cursing rituals? Can we think of a fiery justice-focused sermon in a Christian church as, as performing a similar function? Or is that a sort of qualitatively different type of um, criticism or public action? Mm, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would I would say that like you know the terms of the of the talk in which in interpolation is a function of um, you know how it plays on existing cultural scripts and tropes and then how the people who um, who matter to you in your field of joint attention are also attending to these things. I can't imagine that a general would care much for um, a Buddhist or a Muslim condemning them because it's not as relevant to them or the people that they they care about, and that's that's partially why the the chains that are um, effective is that they do partake on all this Buddhist imagery, but that's not that's not something I've studied. It's definitely worth looking into. Yeah, in some ways, to put on my sort of like positivistic social science hat here, you could imagine um, it's almost like a test case for the idea that interpolation is what's going on here, right? Because if we if we say um, generals don't care about Christian rituals but these Christian rituals do something in terms of cultivating solidarity or sustaining collective action. Um, but, and generals definitely care about Buddhist rituals, but they maybe do a similar uh, social function of, of sustaining activism, just uh, spinning it out for your future, your future projects. Um, well, let's turn to Kurt's question. I'll go ahead and read it out. Um, Elliot, you can take a breather and, um, and prepare a response. So Kurt asks, if interpolation can be understood as a particular sort of singular uh, dyadic reference that not only selects but invites or baits potential addressees to inhabit one figure in a prototypical two-part power relation, what is the semiotic ground of such act? Cosmological, secular, qual-political, or social? Would you venture to elaborate about how the period of NLD rule complicates the semiotic ground for Jane Sa and presumably cartoons? Yeah, I mean, perhaps I went through it a little bit too too rapidly, but I was trying in those different, the sections on the four different modes of interpolation to kind of talk about in essential, in, a, in essence, the different grounds, right? So one was was cosmological in, in the sense that there is this alternative uh, framework of, of potential justice um, that can be appealed to and these two different sort of sovereigns can be pitted against each other, right? You, the secular sovereignty and even sort of you know, Buddhist sovereignty, if, if you listen to what the generals would like to think about themselves, most likely, um, is contested by this other form of, of you know, cosmological sovereignty. Um, but then there's also the sort of secular, quay political or social, as you, as you put it, as you put it here, um, in, in the sense that, you know, social shame, I guess you could say, is a, is a function of, of, uh, of people uh, kind of condemning these acts as, as immoral. And as I, as I kind of riffed um, on the figure of the attendant, the, the NLD as a sort of attendant who tells the general that everything is gonna be okay, that that period of transition complicated the field such that it was very difficult to identify who, who was the, um, the thing to oppose. Um, I, I once in my, my colleague Goto was railing about how no one will take responsibility. And I was like, is it different than before during the military, I mean, during the SPDC period and the military, the formal military period? And he goes, of course, they, they never took, I was like, did they really take responsibility? And he's like, of course they didn't, but we, we knew they were supposed to, right? So we, there was a sort of legible um, uh, uh, per participant framework. Um, and then what is challenging about the transition is that that the state was able to become really, really illegible. And so you had this situation where I argue activists are trying to like basically work to make the, the state legible, right? To like nail it down and try to like conjure it into being so that it can um, try to uh, you know, 
essentially get things from it, shame it into uh, changing the way that it operates. But then even as they do that, then they have to retreat away lest they sometimes get literally killed as a result. So there's this weird form of uh, presencing and, and absencing and, uh, that, that happens as a result. And I think that the cartoons and, and the, um, the chains that play into that. Thanks, Elliot. Um, well, I'd invite folks to send another question and I will um, add my own in the meantime. I was curious with, um, at one point you just mentioned the process of reading the cartoons with others um, and that being part of the, the process of figuring out these meanings, which I know as someone who's also learned Burmese as a third language that is, is not an easy thing to do. So I really appreciated the number of examples and the readings you provided. But I'm curious if you could say more about reading with, you know, who you who you read with and how you came to understand these cartoons and their their work, their cultural work, and also maybe about who the cartoonists are um, and you know to whom is this form of critique or activism or interpretation available? Yeah, I mean, there's a great question. There's a whole sort of like infrastructure of of cartooning and cartoonists, and a lot of it has come quite rapidly for people who exist in a sort of paper medium to exist uh, online. There was a, a Facebook page that had 5 million likes, which is a lot for Burmese Facebook called uh, Brainwave that kind of circulated a lot of these. And I, um, or rather my alter ego, uh, was posting, you know, probably one or two cartoons uh, a week for a couple years there in which I was taking shots at translating them myself and trying to make sense of, um, of their meanings and then asking questions to groups of, of my colleagues and I guess we could say like Burmese academia who were kind enough to read them with me. And sometimes as much as to just say, um, oh, you, you just got you got the words mixed up and that's why it's not funny to you or that's why you think it's funny, but it's not. Um, but often, and this is how, and, and with my colleague Pio and Lat ended up writing a paper on Burmese um, cartooning because we were able to develop the sort of vast range of, of, um, of cartooning subgenres that exist because I would post one and I would say, but this isn't funny. And then and there must be something I'm missing, you know? Um, because I'm a non-native speaker. And then, you know, a number of people would chime in, in the comment section be like, no, no, it's just not funny. I mean, it's a good point, but it, yeah, it, you know, could have been done with more skill and grace. And so the way that that skill and grace is assessed is through, you know, circulation on, online, but also, you know, there's these festivals that exist um, and, you know, they, people come and, and they, they judge the best ones. And, and, you know, I went to some of these or actually my colleagues went to them and, you know, people bring their families out. And you know, so it's, it's really quite a, um, it's a, it's a, um, it's an art form that is also engaged in, because obviously because it's political, but it's engaged also in uh, sort of, you know, people's everyday lives. Um. Yes, as someone who is not particularly funny, I think we could think of being funny as another another sort of magic, maybe <laughs> um, similar to the cursing ceremony that you know does something kind of intangible and and wondrous in the world, creates some sort of change in the world. Um, but yeah, thank you. That sounds like an amazing project and an amazing way to sort of tap into collective reading uh, through digital tools. So um, Eric just asked a question that was actually kind of, um, Hillary actually asked almost the exact same question. Um, and it's good to know that it's, it's a question that um, many people are interested in. And we were saying that it's perhaps not as potent because the, the Buddhists don't care as, as much perhaps. And I would also, reflecting on it again, um, even though I, I you know, stress that the cursing involves sort of the self-interpolation, right? Like cajoling people into induct themselves into, into being um, cursed. Uh, it is still pretty, you know, it's never good to be cursed, right? And as a result, I think minorities like Hindus, Muslims, and Christians might not have the sort of, especially in this particular uh, political environment, have the sort of um, security to launch those kind of assaults, um, rhetorical or otherwise. Um, but I, I, I don't know enough about that. 
Great. And then um, Senu, yeah, Senu had So her question is, um, the, she writes, that, at least among the networks I'm familiar with, it seems that some of the activists who are most outspoken between 2020 have been seemingly more silent since the coup. Others showed a reverse trend of really coming out courageously in a bodily way and speaking out more since after the coup. Can you throw out some conjectures as to why there are contradictory trajectories of activism before and after the coup? Uh, great questions. I know, uh, there's a part of the book where um, Goto, who's kind of the main interlocutor, um, <clears throat> essentially does a soundpyo to Minko Nine, who's one of the more famous 88 generation activists. And what he he posts something to his Facebook wall, um, <clears throat> pledging sort of like, you know, I will fight till I die for the youth who are leading this um, this uprising. My generation, all they do is sit around and write poems. <laughs> and uh, I immediately, because of course, Minko Nine, um, who's a, a lovely chap, I think, uh, I don't, I've never met him, uh, has kind of retreated from uh, politics to mostly engage with his art. And uh, he was getting called out for that. And then, you know, I asked Goto about this because uh, they were, you know, in the streets the next day. And he said, Goto, um, Minko Nine contacted him and said, um, I can't believe you called me out like that. And I guess I will have to, I will have to come to the protest with you, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I can't, I mean, so the people I work with have been, you know, kind of active in, in um, yeah, Okalapa and down to go on in those kind of peri-urban Sinjay bone areas from, from the start. And you know, they went through a period where they were considering fleeing um, to the border, but have so far stuck it out. Um, and, but I mean, they, are less enthusiastic about the chances of, of sticking it out and, and may end up leaving. As for the people who um, you know, were outspoken in 2012 and 20, I'm not, of course, I, I don't know exactly who, who you're, you're talking about, but I do know that there's a, you know, the, the NUG institutionalization aspect has been tricky. And even someone who I respect a lot and think is an amazing activist, Ethan Zalmong, um, has been accused of essentially being co-opted or selling out the uh, the people getting essentially captured by NUG institutional politics. And uh, you know, she keeps saying, um, if I ever feel like I'm not standing for the people, I will I will resign from the NUG. And people I keep calling on her to resign because she, they're saying it's impossible for you to to do this. Um, in other words, to stand for the people in this particular uh, structural position. Um, I don't know as much about that in, in particular, um, but it is kind of understandable because they're being pulled in so many different directions, I guess. The Gitin Zamong, to return to her, she has this, um, had this amazing Facebook post where she dressed up as a bloodied and bruised um, sexual assault victim, essentially. And this is a whole nother really fascinating thing with, um, with protest images that were being used by, by women in, in Myanmar. And she held a sign that said, UN, please ignore us, uh, playing on the fact that other people were saying, UN, don't ignore us. And so her, that was a really fascinating way of calling attention to this addressee, the UN, um, creating this framework in which they probably should be doing something. And then before they had a chance to, to ignore them, she says, no, I'm, I'm one step ahead of you. We had to do this ourselves. And so those kind of things are really uh, fascinating, but they are, of course, the um, and powerful. But they're kind of the exceptions that that prove the rule. And I think most people um, are a little bit stuck in thinking that the that there will be some sort of international um, uh, movement that or campaign or or something, as as it's sometimes said, that will will help um, will help them. And I think only now is. It, um, Simar Ong, I think a couple of days ago said, look, we can't keep waiting for the international to do the right thing. Um, we're, we're gonna have to do it ourselves. One thing that strikes me in that discussion is um, just that each of these symbolic forms of protest, whether it's a cartoon or a curse or a Facebook post, um, yeah, to your description of interpolation with the personal Singapore anecdote was super useful to me. I will remember that forever. So just thinking of interp interpolation as something that calls into being these two subjects and thinking of those symbolic forms of protest as 
um, calling sort of different groups into relationship to each other. I think um, obviously addressing the UN, the medium and the message is so different than um, the addressing the generals. And uh, just to follow on the, the thread that Eric recently brought up, you know, if this is sort of a Buddhist only form of protest, then it also puts a Buddhist subject in relationship to the Buddhist generals, um, maybe in a, in a way excluding Hindus, Muslims and Christians from this particular act of protest and participation. So um, yeah, I think it's uh, really generative to think with. Yeah, and what I think is nice about that is that, um, you know, that all that stuff about beliefs without believers and those folks who are saying, you know, we, we, uh, I, don't, I don't believe in this stuff, but if, but if the generals are afraid of it, I'll do it believingly. Um, and also the reason why I had that anecdote about So Ong telling me that this wasn't some esoteric Buddhist ritual, something that he came up with essentially because he um, dealt with dead bodies a lot, was trying to show that kind of anyone can do it, right? The cultural trope and the scripts are there and they can be animated by most people. And that's kind of cool. So in other words, it would be hard to do a Hindu um, uh, Jainza, but a Hindu could do a Jainza. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Might be even be more effective <laughs> to be cursed by the Hindu. Um, <laughs> great. Uh, let's see. I think that's all for our questions here. Um, so I might go ahead and move us towards wrapping up. Yeah. Can um, I ask a quick question? Please, I can't, Sarah. I can't yeah. use the Q and A, so I'm stuck <laughs> talking. I I would love that. Um, I was, I'm more in a Burma historian frame of mind. I was at the end of your talk, you're talking about, to me, it sounded like you're saying to some degree that the activists now have been building, are building on the protests that have been happening in Burma, well, since 88, at least till now, but I'm also thinking way back to the colonial period. Do you see any kind of through threads in terms of what activists learn over time or are the generational breaks too far apart really to see how people build? I mean, I'm thinking now particularly like looking also at Thailand, the protesters are so young, they don't have any, their own knowledge of previous protests necessarily, but they do seem to know how to do it. Um, I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts about kind of historical trajectory. Yeah, I mean, obviously the most speculative and unsubstantiable part of my talk was the idea that the sort of seeds of contention or the repertoires were seeded, you know, <clears throat> in an earlier era. But I think that the way that, that could be substantiated, maybe if not specifically around chains, and then certainly around the broader culture of contention is through the things that activists have written themselves over the years and how their sort of social intercourse and, and communication operates. So like, as an example, everyone refers, to, everyone gets associated with a particular generational moment, any, any activist. And then, so the 88 generation, for instance, are those activists who came of age during 88, and then there's like 96 generation, there's uh, saffron generation. Now they will be, you know, this will be, I don't even know what it would be called, um, you know, coup generation or something, but it'll go in back before 88 too, right? So 74 generation, um, 62 generation when the, when the, um, the student um, union building was destroyed, was, uh, yeah, was bombed. And, um, you know, these, there was this great book that I've, I've read, I was reading as part of the dissertation called Down Ayata, which means the flavor of prison. And it was written by a bunch of um, the kins who were these sort of like anti-colonial um, activists who became ultimately um, would have been the leaders of Burma and, and some of them were the ones who didn't get assassinated with Aung San. And in this, in this text, which still, you know, circulates today, it's kind of imagined as a, um, a handbook for how to conduct activism. And the, in the editor who in his introduction makes it explicit. If you're gonna be an activist, you're gonna to have to go to prison. These are the things that you're gonna um, have to deal with. And this is, these are the strategies for getting through. Um, and so those kind of things end up getting passed down from generation to generation where the generation denotes a sort of 
um, these like micro generations that how activists organize themselves. And so what's really fascinating about what's going on today, especially in that initial phase is that um, activism is kind of uh, not vanguardist. And what I mean by that is that it's not like we're the ones who are leading the, the people. They, they certainly didn't want to imagine themselves that way, but it is a social type. Like it's a legible social type. You can become an activist and there are ways to go about doing it. Uh, there's like, um, you know, roles and statuses that you fulfill to qualify as, a, as an activist. And it's weird, it's not a great life all the time, but it's something that makes sense to, to Burmese people. But what's going on in this one was a rapid, you know, totally diffuse protest in which you had all these Gen Z people who were um, improvising based on, you know, other things they knew that didn't have anything to do with activism. And to the activist, professional activists, if not professionalized, professional activists, like people who devoted their lives to it in their, to their credit were really amazing. And, and they weren't, you know, gatekeeping. They weren't saying you're doing this this wrong, even though there were things on the internet where people were saying, "Hey, kids, maybe stop with the with the memes," you know. But this is just another imp improvisation that I think was pretty pretty effective and brought a lot of people to the to the streets. Um, Therapy then, and um, a couple co-authors have an article about about this that's quite uh, helpful um, and maybe overstates the sort of generational divide a, a little bit because. Um, maybe presents the generation, the sort of Gen Z activists as, as undifferentiated, even though there's probably a lot of like class issues that, um, that need to be kind of teased out, but as an initial salvo, really interesting in a totally new kind of social activist that didn't exist before. Um, so that's sort of way of answering your question by saying, very dependent on history and writing a totally new one now, and unfortunately one that's still necessary. Feel free to wrap up, Hillary. Sorry, stole your thought. Yep. No, that was a great <laughs> question, Sarah. Thank you for asking it, and a, and a great um, a great answer, Elliot, and a good note to end on. Um, I was just thinking of a, a talk Sainu organized recently, and um, that brought some Burmese activists to talk. And one thing that really stuck out to me is the 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 family relations, the kin relationships that animate these activists. So I think thinking generationally makes a lot of sense when we think about trajectories of Burmese activism. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and wrap up. Um, <laughs> Elliot, do you have any final thoughts to share before I um, send this on my no, way? No, I mean, I would also just thank the audience for their, for their questions. It's, you know, it's always hard to answer questions off the cuff, but I always find that I learn something, maybe like how, how to answer questions better in the future um, at the very least. But in this, it's always productive to think about like how make, to make, to weave humor into the analysis of refusal that I've done with, you know, I hadn't thought as clearly about it as I should have. So like, these are wonderful questions, thinking about how uh, comparative work across Southeast Asia with the use of curses, because I know there's been stuff done and uh, cursing in Cambodia too, could be a really cool project, the thing that um, Eric White mentioned. So thank you for coming out and, um, and I appreciate it. Yeah, I agree. Um, great questions and um, a lot of fun to hear the talk and to moderate the discussion. So thanks to Elliot for being here and sharing your work with us. And thank you so much to everyone for coming and um, take care, be well and be in touch. Thank you. Thanks everyone.